Well, welcome everybody to uh, the Delaplane Art Center's Art at Night Talk. Um, we do a couple of these talks a month, and I'm so excited to have Ben Stamper on with us tonight. Ben Stamper is an artist and filmmaker who draws from his multidisciplinary background as a fine artist, carpenter, and musician. As a creative partner in Helix Films, he creates films that blend poetry, choreography, and myth. His work has received numerous awards and has been screened by National Geographic, Lincoln Center, Cannes Short Film Corner, Metropolitan Museum of Art, The Met Brewer, and, and Brooklyn Academy of Music, and also has been included in various high school and college curricula in the United States and France. Ben, I really appreciate you uh, spending the time to share with us tonight. I'm really excited uh, about your talk. So. Thanks, Corey, and I'm I'm really grateful to be able to share. Um, so what I'll do is um, just give a a presentation um, that will, will be a, a mixture of images, uh, videos that I have uh, produced, and uh, some text. And it's kind of a, a mixture of of all different things, but but hopefully um, the through the totality of of these things will will arrive at, at some interesting discussion and and I really love uh questions and discussion uh that I feel like that's the the best way for me to get at um sort of what is in my head and what my work ends up being about so um and and feel free to jump in um uh if during the presentation um, a question uh, arises, we can take questions just at the end or it can be a conversation as I go. Um, that's totally great. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think what I'd like to do is just begin uh, our time with a reel that I put together, which is, uh, it's, a, it's a showcase of of some of my work that is really going back and forth between uh, the relationship between humans and nature and the natural environment. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and play that, and then uh, we can go from there. So if the video is choppy as I share, um, let me know, and then uh, we can try to adjust any settings that are, are not working. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so it should all be seen a black screen now. Okay, here we go. Thank you. 
Okay, so um, let me know if uh, if that, Corey, did that seem to play okay on your end? Yeah, okay. things look great, sounded good. Okay, good. Uh, if for some reason, as we go along, um, you have technical issues, just feel free to put that in the chat and Corey can um, try and solve that. I'm terrible at looking at the chat while I give these types of, of talks. Um, so that's a that's a reel of, of my cinematography and and some of my directing work and a lot of, for a lot of the projects I do they that my role shifts um, uh, depending on the scope and the size of the project but that's um, typically my my role in filmmaking is uh, cinematography directing and um, and edit, editing as well. I started out as a painter, and so a lot of my concerns in filmmaking, or the way I approach filmmaking, is really approaching it like a plastic art, like painting or sculpture, and and using light as a way to paint, and and that has a long tradition um, behind it in terms of filmmakers really treating film like uh, a traditional art form. Clearly, the the main elements that you're working with in film are light and time. And so as the great Russian filmmaker, uh, Andrei Tarkovsky said, uh, making film is essentially you're sculpting, uh, using time, sculpting in time. And so many, you know, like any art, uh, like any artist, every filmmaker has a different set of concerns, different set of priorities. Uh, so, but tonight I just want to touch upon a few uh, concerns that really span any art form, any genre, any stylistic approach to to art making. And really, these concerns are ones that are universal, um, or, or at least in my experience and collaborating with others from uh, uh, different disparate backgrounds. Um, these concerns that that I want to really zero in, zero in on tonight are ones that um, every artist, uh, in one way or another, uh, finds themselves grappling with. Um, so the first, uh, let me just uh, see if I can go to the next slide. So I just want to share a few images from masterworks that really, um, when I see them, they stop and make me, make me bring, it brings up some type of contemplation or some, some, it, it's an arresting moment. Uh, and it, 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 it often still film stills. I love looking at film stills because, um, uh, as you know, uh, film is 24 photographs a second that is passing through uh, across your eyes and yet when you when you stop a film at any given point if the film is good and the cinematography is well composed then that that image should be able to stand on its own it should be able to arrest you as a single image and um uh, the the it's it's almost just a fun game to play in 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 uh, having one of your finding one of your favorite films and and stopping it at a random point within the film and seeing what that frame says to you and so this is a still that you're looking at from one of my favorite Japanese directors um, Ozu and he. He does these beautiful domestic dramas that post-war Japan uh, that really is a lot of his work is centered around the emerging middle class in Japan. And, and his films are so sensitive and so well composed and so seemingly simple because there's not a lot of big action happening but within these very composed frames he has these beautiful intimate portraits of humanity unfolding 
this is something that really speaks to me. This is another still from an uh, Iranian filmmaker that this, this film is called White Meadows. And one of the most simple, beautiful films that I've ever seen. Just that black costuming on the salt, the, the, the shore of salt. These in filmmaking, uh, the filmmakers who approach film like a plastic art, like painting, like like uh, sculpture, like um, music. They're looking for iconic images that are always standing for something else. They're always images that stand in for something beyond themselves. This is an, a still from a Polish filmmaker, um, Vida, and this, the, the film is called Ashes and Diamonds. In this film, there are some scenes that, the only way I can describe some of the scenes in this film are, they're just true miracles. They, they're things that could only happen in the art of cinema. And just reading this image, there's so much going on, and yet it's 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 a relatively simple composition, but again, it's iconic. This is a Hungarian film by the Hungarian master Belatar from the film Tour and Horse. This is a scene from one of the many scenes in the film of the father and daughter eating potatoes and this scene just plays out the entire act of eating a potato just a raw potato not everyone's flavor but it certainly certainly has an incredible incredible impact if you're if you're willing to go there again this is another film and another filmmaker that is plumbing the depths of humanity. It's another beautiful, iconic still. I'll just take a moment to sit with these. So often we see film as this commodity that is just zooming past our eyes and our ears, zooming past all of our senses. And it's easy to ingest a lot of media and not stop to be affected in a meditative way. Um, I think often I, I think of film as an opportunity to meditate visually and auditorily. There are films that are impossible to do this with, and then there are films that are made that put you into this state. And that's those are the films that I gravitate towards and the films that I'm interested in making. This is a Tarkovsky film called Stalker. Every In film, every element contributes to the whole. So imagine this scene from uh, the film Throne of Blood, the Kurosawa film, which is a reenact, a retelling of Macbeth. Imagine if the background that Kurosawa chose was just a plain wooden wall or a plain white wall, but instead he chose to paint these stylistic clouds in this room that is so memorable. So many of these images I chose because when you watch a film and you remember the film, you remember certain images. And this is one of the images that I remembered uh, from watching this film and not having seen it for 
many, many years, but always coming back to this image in my mind. Just because it had a visceral, a sensual effect, a sensorial effect on me. They almost like, the, 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 I think the power of film can be that it, it can create memories, almost like inhabit your memories. That you that that the memories they embed themselves within your memory, and and that's a very very powerful thing. This is still from one of my favorite films called *The Color of Pomegranates* by a Georgian filmmaker. Called uh, his name is uh, Parajanov. And again, you see just the sim simplicity the power of the the simplicity but there's something about it that speaks to the, you know there's a sense of mystery there's a sense of um otherworldliness there's a there's a deeply human element but there's also the transcendent this is a still from ron fricky's masterpiece samsara and this is uh i believe in the philippines and it's documenting uh, a sacred dance but again just the simple image but composed in such a way that it really grabs you so one of my chief concerns as a filmmaker is this idea of perception and this idea that film has, it should do the job of opening up your senses, of making you more receptive to the world around you, making you more sensitive to the vicissitudes of life, making you more, uh, more childlike in a sense of uh, kind of opening your eyes to see what something truly looks like not not what you think it looks like and in school my art teacher uh was fond of giving us assignments that really pushed this idea this pushed this idea that we think we know what something looks like until we go and try to mix that color uh, the color of a street at night is so different than the same street in the morning or in the afternoon it seems very simple and we all know this but until you really examine these things um something like pavement can take on infinite shades of of or you know infinite hues and um it's just it's it's this is i think the most important uh, work that we're engaged in as filmmakers and artists is this idea that our job often our our work doesn't necessarily need to have inherent value in and of itself that the, the value of our work is that it would create an opportunity for us to walk through this world with greater a greater sense of awareness a greater sense of perception of of the transcendent of our own humanity and hopefully enable us to move beyond this what i call the the tyranny of habit that keeps us from engaging with the present moment keeps us from engaging with what is actually there the real tangible things of life um so i am fond often of writing about my own artistic process uh, lessons that i've i've learned along the way or observations that i make or other people i work with make and so this is one of the things that uh i've learned uh, in the process of making film and I'll just go ahead and read it for you. A conduit not only conveys, it also protects. 
This is the sole source of dignity of an artist. Babette Hersant defiantly proclaimed that an artist is never poor. Jesus of Nazareth told his disciples that he had no food, uh, that, they, that he had food that they knew nothing about, to do not his own will, but the will of another. These two ideas are one and the same. Artists who have embraced their identity as the servant instead of the master are nourished through the act of serving. Masters will never be allowed this privilege and can only be elevated through circumstance. Masters and those who strive to be are routinely manipulated by others, by the opinion of others. While servants who are secure in their service have forged a greater capacity for thanksgiving in the fires of imperfect, hyperpolitical, unromantic, and anti-nostalgic life. So this idea is really the idea that often in art making, it can feel like we're in a war of classes, meaning that uh, it, it, there's, there's often this false dichotomy set up between artist and the appreciator. And I'm interested in making art for the normal person, not for the, not for the critic, not for someone who is, um, you know, looking to uh, fill their minds with uh, a theory about art. I'm looking for this, the person who needs art because they need beauty and they need truth and they need a different way to see the world. Because if art is not able to help you see the world differently, then it's not reaching its potential. And so this is a quote that hopefully sums that up. So what is film? This is a slippery, slippery uh, term, a slippery, slippery word, film, uh, because now technology has uh, become so accessible and so affordable that this this word film is is kind of been diluted uh, quite a bit. Um, but really, film, I think at its best is something that can create, it's an art form that can create a communal experience. Um, there's nothing wrong with watching films alone uh, on your laptop, in your bedroom. We all do it, or on your phone. Um, but really the, the, the medium of film has always been to watch it in the presence of others. If you think about the movie theater, it's a communal act, this ritual of going to the theater, to getting popcorn, um, of choosing your seat. Um, this is this is part of the beauty of film. And uh, it's something that that really defines it as as a form. Um, and it's obviously over the years, over the decades, mutated and expanded. Um, in its definition, but at its essence, um, film is a communal art form. And I think that that's really something worth fighting for. Here's another one of my quotes, um, one of my observations about this very thing. Our common engagement with film is so far from the director's original intention that it is like eating the sauce from your beef bourguignon through a straw, perhaps necessary, but quite a departure from what the chef had in mind. This is often, uh, as a filmmaker, it can be really frustrating to be painstakingly pouring over details about color, about sound, about, about the minute aspects of creating a, a moving image, only to have it consumed on the internet uh, or on on a tiny little phone, when the idea in its to the the full potential of the image you're creating should really be presented on a giant screen in a dark room, 
uh, in a dark theater in the presence of other people. Um, so there's nothing wrong with watching, um, you know, some masterpiece on your phone, uh, but you just have to know the terms and you just have to be aware of the compromises um, that you're making. Uh, nothing wrong with listening to a Mahler symphony, you know, through a telephone receiver, as long as that's what you know you're engaging in. Um, this is important, not only for filmmaking, but for appreciating appreciating any art form is just knowing the terms, knowing the rules of engagement. Uh, so um, if you're looking at a work in progress, that's good to know. If you're looking at a sketch, if you're looking at a finished masterpiece, it's just good to, it's just important and good information to consider um, when you're engaging with, with that artwork. So this is a, um, I included this photo. This is a photo of me uh, in my in my younger years. And this is an important photo because of the stare into, it's like the, this, this to me is the stare of the child wonder. It's the, the dream state uh, of the child. And this is something that, this is another chief concern of mine as a filmmaker is achieving the dream state in my work. If someone can return to the childhood state emotionally, mentally, spiritually, then then the film is doing something. Then the film is getting somewhere. This is another another photograph that illustrates that. This is a photo I took of my son uh, many years back. But again, this this wonderful dream state of a child. Again, the vacant stare, this is my daughter. And it's just the you see the you see something in these in these it's not a vacant stare. It's it's a it's a stare that is looking at something that's not there, right? It's looking, it's a stare that's looking out, but it's more than it's looking out, it's looking in. This is a still from one of my films and this quote by Viktor Shlovsky, who is a Russian film critic, is just wonderful. Habitualization devours objects, clothes, furniture, one's wife, and the fear of war. If all the complex lives of many people go on unconsciously, then such lives are as if they have never been. Art exists to help us recover the sensation of life. It exists to make us feel things, to make the stone stony. And again, this is going back to the idea of really a perception and of really seeing something for what it actually looks like, not for what it stands for. Seeing something for the image that is before you, um, not not what it what it represents. So as we grow and develop as humans, we develop this visual shorthand. And so when we look at it, something, our brain associates it with memory or with experiences that we've had. And often we can, we can, we can uh, look at something without seeing it, or we can uh, hear something without listening. And so part of the, again, part of the job of the artist is to short circuit our maturity or our development and to rewire our brains to to get back to that state where you might be looking at something more accurately by seeing its abstraction if that makes sense 
is very, very important that artists and filmmakers are engaged in this idea of, of getting us to see things in their essence, not just in their superficiality. This is something that I wrote down um, a few years ago. And it's um, really, it's it's something I wrote down because it's it's in this day and age um, all too easy to succumb to the pressure of ha being an expert on everything, having an opinion on everything, of of staking your claim uh, artistically. But it's it's just so important to stop and realize that we need to move through life in such a way as to let ourselves be humbled by the, the great masters who's, who've gone before us. So before you go out and make your mark in this world, make sure that the world has made its mark on you, whether that's other artists, whether that's your family, your friends, your, uh, your enemies, those who uh, can challenge and teach you um, things that you thought you knew. And the more that you go on in art making, the more you realize that uh, how little you know and how how the the pursuit of art making is is a lifelong. It's not just a lifelong um, endeavor. It's it's a century long. It's an eon long endeavor for for that we are all working towards because it's it's our collective understanding of art making uh, that should all be leading somewhere and so we, you should be able to plot out as an artist where do you fall who what is your heritage as an artist what what line of inquiry what what line of you know what what is what if you had a family tree uh, of artists where would you be on that family tree it's a very helpful exercise uh, to engage in. There's three films that really marked me as a child. Um, and these three films that I chose, they all, they, they, something very interesting happened with these, these films. The, this is a still from Vin Vendor's film, Paris, Texas. And this is a film that my brother and I watched um, on t when it was being shown on TV. I think I was uh, ten or eleven. I had no idea what the film was because we started watching it about five minutes into the film, five or ten minutes into the film, and we missed the title of the film. And it just played, and we watched almost all of it, and then we had to go somewhere. So it was. I was so. It was not a film that um, was made for a 10 or 11 year old. It was just, uh, you know, it was a Vin Vendor's masterpiece, but it, I wasn't the audience and yet it drew me in and it so had an effect on me. And um, I, I, all, I would always call it to mind, but I had no idea what film it was. I had no, there was, this is before the internet. This is before Google. So I had no way of, of finding out what it was. And in high school, one of my friends suggested we watch Paris, Texas. And so he puts it on. And so all those years later, when I watched this film again, I had remembered it so vividly and so accurately. Um, and that was just the power of that film, that it made such an impression on me that the memory of it um was 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 just frame by frame and so that's that's not easy to achieve so this is another film that that made a huge uh impact on me um that i first watched in english class um in high school our english teacher showed it to us and it's koyana scotsi and uh 
this is a film that's not a non-narrative film um but it's a film that is it's shot on 70 millimeter film and it's all just the most arresting images of man versus nature and the complicated relationship between the two and more than any other filmmaker this when i watched this film i i said to myself i want to do that i want to explore that question this is another still by the russian master andrei tarkovsky and this is from the film andrei rublev um, about the great russian iconographer um, and again this is a film that i saw in someone's living room many many years ago not really understanding what i was watching and uh, only later in life i came back to it and now it's one of my one of my favorite films our relationship with art is so personal it's it's just so often based on memory and on the associations of the people we were with while we're engaging in that artwork and that's a really crucial element to to art making and art appreciating is to know that two people can look at the same film and have completely different experiences because art is as much of a mirror as it is a window and that sometimes is that concept is belittled sometimes um, by more elite thinkers but it's true what what we bring to the artwork can sometimes make the artwork great and that's that's a beautiful thing that's when it becomes fun my my work um uh began and continues to be i think more informed by other art forms than by a film it's by the art form of film itself so haiku is a uh, as as you know a japanese form, uh, form of poetry that that if there's any one thing that i feel um closely related to artistically it's it's this uh art form uh, of, of haiku and the idea is that you're through a very uh, minimal set of parameters speaking of something much greater and and uh, that's really the spirit um, and the approach that I want to take as a filmmaker is to really invest most of my effort in these tiny little seeds that can be planted in the senses and then when they're thought about and they're meditated on when they're considered and rewatched that they open up new pathways to look at the world differently so i'm going to just just share a uh, brief excerpt of the types of films that i make that go in this direction
it's interesting how at least when I was filming it, I hope it I hope it translates when you're watching it that something as simple as two bottles in the water can take on a relationship and a relationship that you have empathy for um, and something that feels relatable and and these two bottles floating in the water are become engaged in this dance uh, with the with the gentle tide that's going in and out of, uh, and that, that is affecting their movement this is the type of thing i'm talking about um because it it reveals something deeper that we need to all be attuned to and we need to all be aware of that that there there are miracles of the the a divine rhythm and nature that are that is happening all around us all the time little mini miracles of god and if we if we can get to the point where we open up our faculties and open up our senses to to um witness these things um we can be closer to god and and delve deeper into what it means to be human this is my concern as a filmmaker this is my number one desire is to use my work as a way to touch the divine and that's not what everybody um who's making films that's not always their motivation and so but but it is mine um this i'll end with this quote um i i have more to share but i'd love to get some um be able to engage with some questions but this is one of the, my favorite quotes that was i was introduced to by uh, a friend of mine uh joe kikasola who's a film teacher at baylor university and he is really fond of this quote as well um how does a straight line feel it feels as a as I suppose, as it looks, straight, a dull thought drawn out endlessly. Eloquence to the touch resides not in straight lines, but in unstraight lines, or in many curved and straight lines together. They appear and disappear, are now deep, now shallow, now broken off or lengthened or swelling. They rise and sink beneath my fingers. They are full of sudden starts and pauses, and their variety is inexhaustible and wonderful. This magnificent ode to a a curved line or an unstraight line, um, it's it's so effusive about the qualities of just a line, and it's remarkable that the person who said this was Helen Keller, someone who could not see or hear, whose senses um, were because of her lack of faculty in certain areas her senses were so much greater in other areas and we can really learn from that um and as as artists and as art you know if, if your if your concern is art making then i think this is a terribly important um thing to think about is that this is where the idea of less is more comes from is is fasting from certain uh, from certain senses or a certain uh it's it's like a a taking away a sacrificing of, of 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 certain things in order to achieve greater flavor in other things and and that's um often in 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 art making the term kill your darlings is a term that's thrown around a lot because we we often have to engage in this brutal sacrifice of the things that we love the most in terms of elements of um of an artwork that in the course of making a piece of artwork we have to we have to give up and we have to sacrifice because it doesn't contribute to the whole of the artwork and so as a filmmaker the way often the way that plays out is your best shots will never make it in the film your favorite shots will always be on the cutting floor because often those shots are so powerful so much more powerful than 
uh, they're, they're overpowering and they're, they're almost works unto themselves. And so often they will imbalance the overall uh, story or film or piece that you're creating. And so often, you know, it could, it, this is this is the sort of challenge that that an artist will face in and it's really a question of discernment it's a question of of curation of image and of sound for your audience so that they can take in the rate the, the speed of learning the rate of learning that they can take in the information that you're giving them is crucial to be able to as an artist be aware of your audience aware of the information you're putting out and the rate at which people can take in that information whether it's visual information or auditory information or text uh, whatever it is that's what this quote that helen keller from helen keller is all about it's really it's and so that's that's the last principle that that i would love to you know um, share with you uh, before we take questions. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit. And um, Corey, I'd, I'd love to uh, um, just, you know, have you manage the, maybe manage the questions as they come so that we can have a fruitful discussion. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, yeah, if any, if anyone joining us has any questions, feel free. You can unmute and ask it, or if you'd rather not, you can submit it in the chat, and I can send that over to Ben um, or read read it to Ben. Um, any any questions out there? You talked you you talked a bit about breaking the tyranny of habit, and um, and it seems to be that so much of the world is demanding our addiction to, to sort of a blind habituation of, of perception of um, sort of an inoculation to what's actually happening around us. And um, I guess I'm curious if you have a sense at all of, do you, do you think that it's harder so the, the artist lives on the outskirts because of their devotion to attention in that way. Um, they're, they're, they're demanding something of, of the viewer that maybe they, um, that, that maybe the viewer is being demanded of, um, the, maybe us as a society, like we're, 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 it's demanded of us that we take on more of that habituation and sort of that blindness. And so it, it becomes a real challenge in, in as far as like the artist finding their place in a society um, that, that nurtures their desire for people to pay closer attention or to have a deeper perception. Um, yeah. I, I'm not exactly sure where I'm headed, but does that does that make sense? And maybe what would you what would you say? How how do you deal with that personally? But also like, um, it, it to me it makes the work of the artist even more important now than it's ever been before. Um, that that may be, um, maybe it's always been equally important, but it just feels like our attention is being demanded by uh by the superficial more than ever before yeah yeah uh, yeah i think the the question partly is how do you how are we supposed to approach art in a in a world in a society that is uh overrun by information you know this is where we have so much more information at our fingertips than any other time in history and through through just the presence of the existence of the internet, we have access to uh, exponentially more um, images and um, music and 
any art form that uh, at least virtually that we've ever had before. And so how do you, it does, does art have the same value in the age of the internet um, as it did before the internet? And, and I think that that's, to me, that's an important question. That's not, that seems simplistic on the surface, but it's actually, I think, an important one when the market floods uh you know then then the value of of goods goes down generally um and so i think it, it has to cause us to re-examine um and and define you know these terms um of art of media of entertainment and to really um question what it's doing for us you know and and i think for me my concern is not so much about redefining art it's more about just being aware and conscious of what i'm taking in as a human um and how that's affecting my mind and my my spirit and 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 because we're so inundated with I think more information than we are capable of of handling as human beings, and and yet it's, it's become normalized. So I th I think the endeavor that I'm engaged in uh, as an artist is what I'm trying to do is make films that cause people to stop watching so many films. <laughs> and 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 what I mean by that is I want to make films that cause people to go outside. And to not spend all their time consuming media. That's my goal. <laughs> my goal is to outmode myself and to and to encourage relationship, to encourage relationship with nature, to encourage relationship with each other, to encourage um, us to look at, at the world around, to open our eyes and look at the world around us. And so um, that's that's my goal. And I guess as, as a person, that's what I'm trying to achieve in my own life and, and hopefully, and I think naturally in, in, in my own work. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that is what came, that comes up, you know, a lot yeah. for me. Um, and, and so a lot of the time, um, I, I think a, the discipline of silence is important of, of not, of choosing to not um, always be inundated, allowing yourself to be inundated by by information. Um, it's very, it's a discipline. It's very hard to do, as we all know. But I think as an artist, um, it's crucial that we do that. Um, otherwise, we're. It's it's very easy to to um, cease engaging in in the present you know with the person that's right in front of you with in the present moment but i think Great. that art has the opportunity to help us just help remind us how to be human mm -hmm. and that's really what it comes down to i think for me yeah i have a question yes can you hear me yeah yeah okay um i was i i'm wondering when you look through the camera do you see everything or when you edit, is that when you see all this magic that wasn't evident when you look through the camera? Yeah, I, I think sometimes I will see something after that I didn't see when I captured it. And that's always a wonderful surprise, but usually, usually i'm seeing it as i'm filming it because what i try to do when i'm behaving is i try to look uh first and to really um spend time with an image before i record it before i before i capture it because um often and I think this is important for everybody to do is when you come upon a scene, um, whether it's uh, uh, just a landscape that you're 
out taking a walk and you're you you know there's a landscape before you or or trees or birds or you know just looking out your back window you can or or looking at just a the still life that's the centerpiece of your table um you can look at something and your brain because we're we're you know we're humans and we have activities and we have things to do and we have schedules and we have lives that we're living our brain you know has that shorthand that says tree landscape cat you know traffic um and and it just often we we substitute what we're seeing with like um we just kind of check it off like we visually shorthand it so we don't actually we're not actually seeing it we're not actually perceiving and engaging that specific and particular moment and so but if you stop and you, you say okay i'm looking at my back window uh, something that i've done a thousand times before but and but you let yourself look at it longer than is than you normally would and maybe one minute two minutes three minutes goes by and something starts emerging and you start your habits the habitualization breaks down and you start seeing things that you never saw before and not because of any other reason than your you time is allowing you and the duration of your of your 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 gaze is allowing you to see something for what it truly is and mm -hmm. so simply by just looking at something longer than um you're used to can really open up those faculties and it's really really exciting um because it's so simple and yet it's so important this idea is so important for relationships and for everyday life um it's just such a simple principle but so easily forgotten mm -hmm. and um so yeah often when i'm capturing something i will sit with it if i had the luxury of doing that um of course it depends on the genre of filmmaking some filmmaking projects don't allow you to sit with every image um for longer than the moment it's actually happening before you mm -hmm. but but if at all possible i'm I'm trying i'm looking for the thing that is under the surface you know and, and reading but trying to read between the lines so mm -hmm. that because i have a sort of reoccurring saying that i i try to say to myself when i'm filming in a documentary setting where you're it's a very reactive when you're making a when you're filming a documentary it's a reactive posture you know instead of a not necessarily a proactive posture of creating a story from the ground up like a narrative film mm -hmm. but when it's documentary things are happening and you're reacting trying to capture those things yeah and often what i try and remind myself is this so often the subject is not the subject the thing that you identify as the subject often is not the most interesting thing happening so often the really interesting thing that's happening is way over here out of frame <laughs> and it's, it's easy to be enticed by the thing that's supposed to be the subject but there might be something that's far more interesting and far more informative that has nothing to do with why you're there so it's important to just be always asking that question what is the real subject here what is the point of this moment? What is the point of this image that I'm trying to create? Um, and that is often when it gets fun, when you can recognize those things and frustrating when you when you miss the point of, of that moment, which happens probably more often than not. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions from anyone? Um, ben, I wonder if you could talk just for, you know, briefly about collaboration 
it seems like you know a lot of artists uh if you if you're a painter you know you're working sort of in a little bit in isolation in your studio but it seems like a, as a filmmaker um especially with some of the work you've done uh, with dance groups and choreography and things like that um and and as well as you know your uh your your um i believe you have a partner with helix films right so yeah. so collaboration seems to be a big part of what you do could you you know say a few words about collaboration yeah absolutely yeah i i i do um the i'd say the majority of my work i do in partnership with a filmmaker uh, named andrew ellis and uh, and he and i have been working together for over a dozen years on many different types of films and um yeah, I think that collaboration for me has become a, a, a really crucial element of, of my work. I mean, filmmaking by nature is a collaborative art form, and especially the, um, the, the some films can be collaborations of hundreds and hundreds of people, um, and and in some cases, thousands of people. It depends on the scope and the scale of the project, but that's just an extraordinary thing that you can have an art form that requires the manpower of hundreds of different people and skill sets and experiences and all hopefully aimed at making the same piece of work. And the unsuccessful films are when different departments are making trying to make a different kind of film and uh, but if every department involved in that project is aimed in the same direction, then something really wonderful can happen. And uh, so the films that I work on are much much smaller scale, and they're not they're not industry films that are made by studios. They're they're films that are made. It's just independent filmmaking, often. Uh, the largest crew that I've worked with is under 30 people and so it's a much smaller um mechanism uh and, and yet even in the smaller scale projects collaboration is is can be either make or break the film um and the, i think for me the one of the things that is so exciting about it is that you're just always in a state of learning. You're never in stasis when you're collaborating. Um, you're never, uh, even if it's collaborators, collaborators that you've worked with many, many years, um, if it's a true collaboration, you're always in this, this state of discovery and of learning something new and of, of bouncing, even if it's just bouncing ideas off of each other. Um, I think it's crucial um, because it helps keep ideas fresh and from being, um, helps keep the artist from going over the same um, processes over and over. Hopefully it will break the habits that we develop over time. Um, so it's, yeah, I think that it's, even in art forms that are solitary, like like painting, like illustrating, um, or like, you know, solo musicians, um, you, you know, they they still um, hunger for collaboration at in things like feedback and things like the other art artists that they that they allow into their sphere and and the artwork that they're looking at and the life experiences that they're looking at and um so yeah i just i think it's inseparable from the artistic process it may might look different um in terms of whatever art form you're engaged in but but as humans um we're made for other humans so uh i think it's 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 impossible to to really create without some kind some type of collaboration and even the most solitary artists are collaborative collaborators with their audience and it really does take an audience to complete the artwork um 
at least in my at least from my perspective that's great well any other questions i want to honor ben's time and honor everyone's time tonight um so we can wrap things up if there aren't any other questions ben did you want to are you working on anything right now um just as kind of yeah. a way to close things out what what are you working on what projects are you excited about and yeah i'm i'm currently um working on a um but the type of filmmaking i do i always have many projects going at once and so some are projects for clients um and they're more commercially oriented and some are um personal projects that that I'm developing and uh, right now I'm working with my partner Andrew um on a developing a narrative film um that's that a feature film that we're planning to shoot next year and it's it's kind of a prodigal son story um that takes place in central California um and and it's centered around this very niche uh extreme sport uh which is flat track motorcycle racing and so it's this high speed dirt track racing that is extremely dangerous but it is a very um interesting interesting sport because uh, uh so much so many people who participate in this sport do it because their fathers did it and their grandfathers did it and it's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of fam family dynamics within the sport and it's the stakes are so high and it is so dangerous and yet there's nine ten eleven year olds doing it there's um always you know emts and ambulances at every race just like any extreme sport just at the ready um there's um just a an enormous amount of uh, risk and yet it's a very very it, there, there's there's a lot of addictive quality to it because of the adrenaline um, but also because of it, the simplicity of it you're just going around in a circle basically but you're doing it really fast and you're doing it in in ways that are extremely uh, impressive if you know what's going on so it's kind of a very small niche world to tell a much more ancient story of the prodigal son of someone who's departing their home and seeking fortune and in many ways incredibly immature and seeking success kind of shortcutting the hard road uh, and ending up coming to their senses and returning to um the 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 way that's been set you know by by this person's uh forebears so in returning to that that love and that um way of living that that brings life and and so that's that's kind of the this project I'm, I'm developing with my partner Andrew right now and and it's really exciting to because a lot of what how we're developing it is we're developing it by just interviewing people going to these races and dipping our toe in this world that we have no idea anything about and just learning and and essentially creating a documentary to then create a script from and create a story from and so it's using sort of one type of one genre of filmmaking to create another genre of filmmaking so that's a really fun and interesting process um but really it's just been wonderful to meet all sorts of people and and share their experiences as you're doing that are you are you thinking about the documentary side of things as a step towards making something that uh that can be more um i don't know as an as an artistic project or are you considering the documentary as 
uh, in in that way as well. Yeah, the documentary is pure process. It's not something that will be for public gotcha. consumption. Gotcha. It's just for our own understanding of I see. the subject, and and um, it's it's research, really. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, but that will all in one way or another work its way into this narrative film. Yeah, um, even in just the developing of characters and you know really getting to the specifics of this world that feel genuine and true, and not some artifice um or superficial idea but yes yeah just trying to understand the humanity and uh is is as well as possible gotcha. so that's been fun it's kind of an ethnographic approach yeah that that feels really satisfying huh. very cool well i really appreciate your time ben um really fascinating work i love i love uh mulling over what you're doing and um just beautiful stuff i'm excited about what's around the corner and uh really appreciate your time tonight well thanks so much everyone for taking the time to to join me and hope you all have a great great night thanks so much Corey. yeah thank you all for being here we'll see you soon thank you ben okay. thank you